Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I must admit, everything that's been happening in the last few days, I began to wonder whether anything was going to gather. And I'm very pleased to see you here. I promise not to breathe on you. And if we'll just wave, it would be fine to, to uh, communicate. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be here. As Mary said, I spent some time here a couple of summers ago, I guess, looking through the Cornelia Clark uh, glass, slide, uh, glass negatives. Amazing collection. And I'm so pleased that they were saved. And we now have some of those images available online. You can see them through the uh, Historical Society site. Um, and I encourage you to take a look at them. They're, they're quite spectacular, in my opinion, anyway. <clears throat> Thank you, too, for being willing to listen to me. Uh, despite what Mary said about what I should know about Russia, <clears throat> I feel rather insecure saying something about Iowa. As I've explained to a number of people, I taught at, uh, at Grinnell for 30 years and paid no attention whatsoever to the town that I was living in. Every time I got a chance to go somewhere, I went to Russia or went to Europe and so on, and I, I, I paid very little attention to it. But happily, once I retired, I had time on my hands, and I wanted to stay out of the way of everybody else uh, at the college. And so I got to know a little bit about the town, and I've enjoyed uh, learning about it, and I've enjoyed sharing it. One of the things that's been really uh, special to me is how interested people are in the area where they live, and if you can talk about it, uh, it generates lots of enthusiasm, and I've had a lot of fun, a lot of fun doing that. What I'm talking about today is African Americans, and I feel sort of doubly uh, anxious about that because, as you can see, I'm an old white guy, and uh, I'm talking about people who, by and large, were left out of the narrative of the town. I'm going to talk about Grinnell, which is special in some ways, but I suspect that many of the things I have to say will apply to lots of towns in Iowa where um, a kind of presumption of white privilege, I think, has overridden lives of people, many of whom are quite remarkable. I think some of the people I'm going to talk about today were quite remarkable people. But uh, in the history of what people talk about uh, Grinnell, these folk are essentially unmentioned. So I want to try to talk about that now, talk to you a little bit about the book. I should mention, by the way, that the book, which you can purchase if, if you like, I get nothing out of it. So if you, if you buy it, the Historical Society of Grinnell gets a little bit of money out of it, but otherwise uh, I won't be any richer and I won't be treating you to uh, drinks afterwards. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, what about uh, Grinnell? <clears throat> like a lot of Iowa towns, it was sort of mid-19th century founding. Um, it has the advantage of two intersecting railroads, which came a few years after its founding and so on. But in other respects, it was largely a New England transplant. Uh, and it brought a lot of white people from New England gradually settling and, and making their home there. It uh, was nevertheless uh, a town where African Americans, even in the middle of the 19th century, were very welcome. Uh, J.B. Grinnell and the other founders of the town were noted abolitionists, active abolitionists. And Grinnell was one of the way stations on the Underground Railroad, which meant that there were African Americans passing through town almost from the very, very founding of the town. Famously, at least from Grinnell's point of view, John Brown himself spent some time there. He overnighted, in fact, in the house of J.B. Grinnell. He brought with him a handful of African Americans, slaves, and he was taking to uh, Canada. So there, there is this kind of rebel context that, that undergirds the town from the very beginning. And by and large, uh, Grinnell, like most Iowa towns, I think, supplied lots of Union soldiers. Um, and this means that there was a kind of, of uh, consent already from the beginning, I guess, that the cause of the uh, Civil War was a cause that Iowa could embrace. And this is a photo from about 1900, I think, of the veterans that were gathered in Grinnell to celebrate having uh, lived through the war and having done what they thought was their, was their part. Nevertheless, uh, not everyone in Grinnell was, uh, from the beginning anyway, particularly pleased with the notion of African Americans in their town. And there are a couple of things that uh, are worth thinking about. Uh, despite all the enthusiasm for the Union cause, there were also Grinnell residents who volunteered for the Confederates. And uh, that's not often talked about, but nevertheless, it, it indicates that there was some uh, undercurrent, I guess you would say, uh, from the very beginning. And perhaps more importantly, from my point of view anyway, is a kind of riot which took place in 1858 uh, about the schools. And the issue had to do with African Americans who were in the schools. 
And uh, Leonard Parker, some of whose uh, papers are here, an important part he played in education at uh, the college and also in the public schools in Grinnell. Leonard Parker was at that time in charge of the schools and he had to confront a group, riot is how it's usually described, people who wanted, as they put it here, pardon me for saying so, no in their school. And uh, to Parker's credit and to the credit of the school system and so on, these students were defended. But the reason I mention this is I think we need to back away a little bit from this notion of a kind of, you know, one happy time from the beginning of uh, a white town with African Americans. Now one of the things that I did uh, with my time, uh, my retirement time, is to try to identify as many African Americans as I could in Grinnell. Now most uh, of the African Americans show up only in what you might call official documents, that is to say, censuses and to some extent city directories and so on. Government was more interested in them than were the other recorders. So that there's not a great deal of material that survives other than those sort of official records. And they um, were periodic. The U.S. Census, of course, was uh, every decade or so, which means that people came in between and left, perhaps. So a complete record is impossible. But even with this kind of imperfect record, in the 19th century and up until about uh, 1930 or so, I found more than 200 uh, African Americans who spent time in Grinnell at one time or another. And looking at it over time, one of the things that interests me is that Grinnell seems to have been a more popular destination at some times than others. So if when the town was basically founded, the very first uh, census, 1860, found one African American in town, a former slave that had arrived with a household from Maryland and set up uh, life in, in the, in the uh, rural section just outside of town, so on. He died very soon thereafter. But interestingly, after the Civil War, there was a whole uh, wave of African Americans who made their way to Grinnell, presumably because the town had attracted a reputation as a hospitable destination because of the Underground Railroad and other, uh, other services. So that in 1870, for example, from the point of view of the percentage of the population, Grinnell had more African Americans than it ever had after or since. So that, uh, and by 1880 already, the numbers are, are uh, trending downward, despite the fact that the town as a whole was getting larger. Most of these first arrivals were singles, uh, mostly male, and uh, almost all of them came out of slavery. Practically every state in the Union ended up. I've sometimes marveled at this, to think that this little town in the middle of the prairie should somehow attract people from Georgia, the Carolinas, and so on. But it's true, the census, of course, one of the questions in the census asks, where did you come from? And uh, they identify all of, these, uh, all of these states. But my theory is that uh, it was more amenable for African Americans in the beginning than it became over time. The college is a little bit of a complicating factor here because the college which had moved there, moved to Grinnell in the 1860s, uh, well, I guess, uh, had been settled originally in the, in the uh, Quad Cities and had made its way over to the middle of Iowa. Uh, the college had in the 1870s a series of African American students. Um, not all of them finished, but there was a representation of African Americans in the student, uh, the student body. But from about 1880 or so until 1920, a couple of years on either side, you can shorten it, there were no African Americans at the college. No students, no faculty, nobody even uh, washing the floors and so on. So that the, in a way, the, what had begun as a kind of uh, hospitable ending place for African Americans seems somehow to have become less attractive. And to me, that explains why so many of the people who were here in 1870, let's say, uh, decided that they wanted to go somewhere else rather than, uh, rather than stay at Grinnell. Grinnell did not benefit from the Great Migration. It was not a place to which great many African Americans came because they could find factory employment, although there were factories in Grinnell. Uh, some of the most famous are the ones which show up on this uh, slide here, the Spalding buggy, later an automobile uh, factory. The Grinnell Washing Machine uh, Company, by about 1920, had 150 or so employees. Um, Morris and Ricker Glove Factory had not, was not that large, but nevertheless was a, a fairly prominent manufacturing facility and so on. No African Americans worked at any of these facilities. In the 1920s, uh, uh, something called Photocraft, I think it was, 
had visited Grinnell and done a series of these panoramic photographs. So you have the entire uh, working staff, let's say, of the washing machine company, all of them spread out and gross. It's a wonderful photograph. I'm, I'm thrilled that we have it. But it's also very depressing in a way because you look at this photograph and look as hard as you can and you won't find an African-American face. <clears throat> and we know that this is, in fact, what, uh, what was happening. One of the families that I uh, looked into is uh, called the Renfro uh, family. I'll have more to say about them in a minute. But Alice Renfro, who spent most of her career as a librarian at the Library of Congress, uh, she retired after, I think it was 40 years at the Library of Congress, ended up as head of the filing division. I think it was very prominent, never mentioned in uh, the town of Grinnell. She was interviewed after her retirement in 1982. A Grinnell College student contacted Alice. He contacted a lot of other people as well. But Alice uh, said, and this is something I wanted you to attend to, uh, they didn't have any Negroes down at the glove factory nor at the canning factory. They used to hire just anybody white who could look like they could read ABC, and that's all. They would hire those people, but not us. Well, in a way, it's not surprising, of course, um, but it was never mentioned. If you look at any of the histories of the area or the town, and so on, none of this is mentioned. Not even as a, you know, this might involve a little further investigation and so on. It's just ridden over as though there was nothing but white folk doing, doing good things. This is that panoramic photo that I mentioned of the washing machine uh, factory workforce in 1920. And it's a kind of illustration to me of how people understand Grinnell's history. They understand it as basically a white, black and white, maybe I should say, picture that depended entirely upon white people. And the only kinds of examples that we see otherwise are rather more complicated. I wanted to mention a, an interesting case. John Lucas, <clears throat> well, John Lucas in most respects, I guess most people would describe as black. He was born to a slave family. Uh, Henry uh, Lucas had purchased his uh, freedom and made some money and uh, gold in California and came back and purchased his wife out of slavery and their child was John Henry Lucas. Uh, John Lucas belonged to something called the Modern Woodmen of America, one of these fraternal organizations. Grinnell had, I don't know, six, eight of them, you know, uh, many towns in Iowa depend upon uh, organizations like this. And like most of them, it was all white, all white men. But the Woodmen were interesting because they raised this case of whether or not John Lucas was white. And they sent this to the uh, Executive Council of Modern Woodmen. They met in Dubuque in 1897, and the council sat down and said, well, now, what's the problem here? And this is how they laid, laid the problem out. In the end, they decided that, well, he was mostly white and therefore must be white. <laughs> so he remained a member. But the interesting thing to me is the way they talk about this. Um, See, that second paragraph there shows that the neighbor is an intelligent, honest, and industrious citizen. In other words, just like us, right? White. Um, to whom no member of the camp or community objects. He's engaged in an honorable occupation. He was a barber at that time. I'm not sure what was uh, honorable about it. But, and his social life, his associations are more with white than the colored, although he does not ignore the latter. It's a weird thing. Uh, very weird. Uh, I know I've been in contact with some of the descendants of the Lucas family, and when I said this thing about how no blacks had been working in any of the factories and so on, one of them wrote me and said, well, you know, uh, John Lucas worked at the Spalding uh, Buggy Factory. He was a fireman for a while. I said, yeah, I know that, but I don't know whether he was African-American or not. That's not at least what the woodmen thought that he was. Well, anyway, um, <clears throat> Grinnell, uh, like a lot of towns, uh, maybe the towns that, that you're uh, from perhaps, celebrated its history from time to time. And one of the things I found interesting was to look at these histories and see where they made space for African Americans. And the short answer is not much. Uh, in 1904, there was a special celebration for the first 50 years, and there was no mention of any African American anywhere. <clears throat> 1929 was bigger. It was the 75th anniversary. And they held it over two days and put together, among other things, a complete program. There were dances and, and uh, orchestras and all the rest of it, including a little pageant, a play. So that if you counted everybody who was involved, there were 100 and some people, I think, that took one part or another in the, in the celebrations. So on. there was only one African-American who took part. And that was a woman, it was actually Mrs. Renfro, who played the part of a fugitive slave woman. <clears throat> 
And the text, this is what she was supposed to respond to. This is the narrative. Uh, she's welcomed into this home, and the mother says, if you'll feel safer, we'll hide you in another room, and I'll bring food. And the colored woman, as it's written here, says, can't we start now? The father, this is white father, of course. You must believe me when I say it's safer to wait. Darkness is our friend. We've done this often, never failed. Here's the part that you're supposed to attend to, right? You're so good to me, right? Uh, it's a dependent relationship. African Americans dependent upon whites who are in power and doing good things for African Americans. I've often wondered, uh, there's a lot written about uh, this woman, Mrs. Renfrew, I'll say a little bit more about her. I've often wondered what she thought about going through this. I asked her daughter at one point, her daughter is still alive, by the way. Her daughter is 105 in uh, June, I think it is, she'll be 106. The college gave her an honorary degree last year and she's the sprightliest, uh, most amazing woman I've ever seen. She's part of a special ager, age, super agers program that Northwestern University is studying. Anyway, I asked her daughter, what did your mother think about these things when she came home? Did she talk about, you know, well, they want me to be kind of grateful and, and about it. I said, no, my mother just said, let other people be themselves and we do our thing. That's even more amazing to me. <clears throat> In 1954, there was a lot of attention in Grinnell to the centennial, a century of progress, they called it. Of course they, of course they did. And it was a big, it was a big deal. And uh, the booklet that came out with it had lots of stuff in it, all kinds of good things. You see the fire department and all the rest of it and so on. What I draw your attention to here are these two items right here. So, of course, they're all on the same page, right? John Brown. And then there's Old Mumph. Well, Old Mumph was Mumford Holland. Uh, he too had been a slave. He had come to Grinnell uh, with the man with whom he'd served in the uh, Union Army and had followed a series of uh, kind of, what would I call them, low pay jobs, including this one. He ended up as a kind of rag man. I don't know whether, what you call that anymore, recycling expert or something uh, perhaps now. But what he did was uh, pick up rags and he was a kind of colorful figure but nobody really knew anything about him. When he died in 1916, they were, how old was he? Well, he might have been 100, he might have, did he do this? I mean, it was full of stories that no one really knew. No one really spoke to the man. They saw him as a kind of object of interest, a kind of icon, a curiosity, and so on. But this is, this is as much as the, the, uh, the celebration could admit to African Americans. The sesquicentennial in 2004 did not even have that. We didn't have a picture of Mumph or anything else. It was just going, uh, going the way of progress. Well, uh, what explains uh, all this? Well, <clears throat> one thing that I think ought to be admitted fairly easily is that uh, there was a kind of uh, what I might call passive racism at work. Uh, one of those things you can be comfortable with. You know, it's the world, that, that's kind of how I know about it, and it doesn't bother me, it doesn't trouble me. There aren't that many people, African American people, that I need to, need to worry about. Even uh, the Renfro's we know have told us that, among other things, one of the most popular uh, stores in town was something called Candyland. It was a sweets and ice cream shop and so on. They would not allow African Americans in the door. I asked Edith, the 105 year old woman, I asked her a couple of years ago about this. I, was there a sign or what? She said, No, African Americans just knew you could not go in that door. And ditto with the movie theater. You could enter, but only if you sat in the balcony. Well, nobody talks about this. And when you point this out, say, Well, isn't that something we should? Well, it's, you know, it's kind of uncomfortable and no thank you. And, <clears throat> the college wasn't in much better shape either. Uh, one of the magazines or journals that was produced at the time, something called the Malteser, it's much uh, talked about because uh, Joe Rosenfield, who left behind a considerable wad of money for Grinnell College, uh, Joe Rosenfield was for a time the business manager of the Malteser. But in the 20s, the Malteser engaged in a lot of humor that was uh, frankly offensive, including this kind of uh, photo here. They were trying to talk about you know, who is going to be beautiful and so on. And uh, this petite lass, the middle one I'm looking at, probably will be uh, the dark horse in the race. Get it? Really funny. Um, well, that's the kind of thing that showed up with, you know, we all understand kind of. That is to say, we're all white and we understand that's how you do these things. We don't want to admit the uncomfortable truth. One of the things that really surprised me when I was doing a study of uh, Grinnell in the 20s was that Grinnell had a chapter of the Ku Klux Klan.
Now, it turns out that several of the people I'm going to talk about today were graduating from high school in the 20s, just exactly when the Klan was driving, riding through downtown in white sheets and pointy hats and so on and holding big rallies. I mean, it's true. Uh, there were no lynchings or anything like that. But there was no secret about what the Klan represented. And to be African-American in the town, therefore, and to see this had to have been terribly uh, upsetting. We don't know. I, I, I'm on the board of the Historical Society in town, and I keep hoping that somebody's going to find in their attic the records of the local Ku Klux Klan. We don't know who they were. But if you go by the records of the Ku Klux Klan elsewhere, the, the Indiana and Oregon, I think the, the membership list came to light. Uh, in both cases, they were the prominent people in town. It was not unlike joining the Woodmen of, of America and so on. It was what you did when you were a potent person in town. And so uh, what, it, what it was like, therefore, to be African-American must have been very, uh, very unsettling. Many of you will know that in the mid-20s, when the, the Klan was getting uh, very successful in Iowa, um, for several years uh, they held a kind of counter-demonstration across from the state fair. Um, and among other things, they put up crosses like this one, a hundred foot cross, which they burned across from the fair entrance in order to make sure that everybody knew that the Ku Klux Klan was operating in Iowa. Uh, this is all stuff that, uh, you know, uh, nobody talks about when they talk about uh, how history passed in, in Grinnell in the, in the 19th century. Well, uh, whom do I want to talk about? I want to say just a few words about uh, some of the people that are in the book. Uh, Emma Morgan is an interesting case, and it's one that uh, I hope if you, if you read the book, you'll uh, spend some time thinking about and share with me any insights that you have. Emma Morgan was a slave girl who was found in a, an orphanage in New Orleans uh, in the mid-1860s uh, by two doctors from Grinnell who were serving in New Orleans. She was very fair, which is to say, the newspapers wrote several times about this, that uh, you know, she would confuse people. They'd say, well, can you name for me, please, who's the African-American in the Sunday school class? It was the Congregational Church that sponsored her arrival in Grinnell. Can you name the African-American? And people would look around, and so on, they'd pick somebody else, right? And then they'd laugh, ha, 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 see, you missed Emma, Emma Morgan. Um, we ran across her quite by accident, her uh, Bible. She was given a Bible by these doctors who had saved her. And her Bible showed up in the collection of the uh, Historical Society without any explanation for how it had gotten there. But a little note inside had been written by her friend, uh, the daughter of her friend, actually, uh, that provided a little bit of history of how she had gotten there. Emma Morgan uh, arrived in Grinnell probably in 1866 or 1867. She was said to be very bright, uh, reported to be one of the best students in school, and this showed up several times in the newspaper and so on. Uh, she joined the Congregational Church in 1871 and gave evidence of her conversion to Jesus, as they put it, and in 1872 fell quite ill and died. No obituary appeared in the Grinnell papers. There was just a little note that said Emma Morgan died yesterday. <clears throat> Someone in town took the time to write an obituary and published it in the National Missionary Journal of the Congregational Church. But she used only her initials, FSR. I still don't know who this is who wrote it. FSR wrote an obituary about her, told some of the story about how she'd been picked up, how she'd done well in school, and so on and so forth, and said only that she had died from a torturous illness, but not identified. Emma was not buried in the main part of the cemetery. She was buried in the uh, potter's field. There was no stone for her. Uh, it's, a, it's a weird ending to the story, and it makes me wonder why no one, no one in the church, they had sponsored her for several years, why the doctors who had rescued her, she'd been living in the household of one of the deacons of the Congregational Church, nobody stepped forward and said, look, we're going to remember this. Even that slave, remember me telling you there was one African American in 1860 in Grinnell? That slave has a, has a gravestone, but Emma Morgan does not. And uh, I hypothesize that something terribly wrong happened there, and the town couldn't deal with it, whatever it was. Uh, and so she was, no one knew about Emma Morgan. There was no reference to her, no memory. She'd sort of slipped out of, uh, out of knowledge entirely. Much of the book is devoted to uh, the offspring of George and Eliza Craig. Uh, these are the two elderly folk here, George 
and Eliza, both of whom were born in slavery. We know quite a bit about uh, Eliza, not so much about George. They both died in 1924. Eliza's buried in Grinnell. George, I'm not sure where he's buried. I haven't been able to find it yet. Uh, Eliza herself was uh, born in South Carolina. She was the offspring of a union between a French slave owner and one of his slaves. And he tried to have her emancipated at his death. There was a long interval afterwards. Uh, uh, executors uh, were looking to recoup the money that, was, that slavery represented. And so on. But finally, she made her way, thanks to the offices of the uh, Friends, made her way to Ohio and then ultimately to West Branch, just up the way here, uh, and it's had an, in West Branch where she married uh, George. Um, the two of them settled in Oskaloosa for a while, and then they moved to Grinnell about 1895. These are other members of their uh, family. I, I want to point, th this is John Lucas. Remember me saying about how John Lucas was the one whose race was somewhat indeterminate? And uh, there is, you know, perhaps there's something in that visage that explains this, I'm not sure, but Lucas was a son-in-law, so he was married into, into the family. But what uh, matters for our purposes are the three daughters of the Craig family uh, who are represented uh, here. The youngest one on the far corner, this is the one who gives birth to, the, she marries Lee Renfrew, and it's her children that I'm mainly going to talk about uh, today. Uh, this is Theodora, or Dora, who married John Lucas, and that they left a number of children, eventually settled in uh, California. And Anna Good, who remained in Grinnell, married, her, her first husband died, she married again later and so on. But uh, it's, the, it's the Renfro offspring that I want to talk about uh, most. Here's the sort of summary of who they, who they are. Uh, the ones that I'm talking about are the four oldest here. So this is the couple that married. The asterisk means that they're buried in, in Grinnell. So Helen was the oldest, Alice, Rudolph, Evanel. And I'm not, Edith is the one that's 105. I mentioned to you before, she's still going on, right? and Paul, her brother, who died in 1974. So these are the four I want to just say a few, a few, words, a few words about. Here's, I love this photograph. We're so lucky. Part of what happened to make this project possible is that when I started looking into this, <clears throat> Grinnell has something called Palaszczuk History Preservation Project, and it's like a lot of other places now. The idea is to try to scan records, especially photographs, and uh, return the originals to the people who own them and so on, but then in the central repository you have a record. And I asked the woman who was uh, running this, Monique uh, Shore, I said, do we have any photographs of African Americans? Well, they had that picture of old Mumph, remember me showing you Mumph with a, bit, you know, but there was not much, uh, much more than that. And uh, just about that time, Grinnell College had uh, interviewed Edith Renfro for an article in the college magazine. And I asked uh, about this particular event, and I said, uh, you know, are there any photos there? And the answer was yes, there were photos. And so we reached out to Edith, and she allowed us to scan about 25 or 30 photos from their family. Otherwise, we would know almost nothing uh, about the family. And this is one of my favorites. Um, this was the home in which these folk lived, and, and they were enjoying their own life, quite independent of what, what was going on around them. Now, these were the four oldest uh, children. Helen uh, was born in Grinnell. The other three were born in Red Wing, Minnesota, where they lived for a few years. He was working as a uh, porter at Lee. That is, the father was working as a porter in uh, Red Wing. But then they came back to Grinnell before 1910, and all the children went through the schools in Grinnell. Going through the Grinnell schools, we don't have pictures like this for everybody, but this is Alice, the second oldest, when she was a first grader. And all the kids must have gone through something like this, namely to be the only black person in the class. Uh, many of the photos, this is unusual because some of them, uh, I'll, see, I'll show you a different one in a moment, but quite often there's a kind of unconscious artistic mind coming to work on the photograph, and so they want to position the one black face in the very middle, you know. This is unusual to see Alice off on the, on the corner, although maybe, it, maybe it's more uh, powerful. This is the photograph, actually this showed up in the, the Citizen, uh, Press Citizen yesterday, uh, the picture. There's Evanel, who's the fourth oldest in the very middle. She took a master's degree here from the University of Iowa and she was in the economics, uh, home economics club. And, and there you see the kind of artistic uh, effort at work. I had hoped, I spoke to, I mentioned the Press Citizen, I'd spoken to the reporter there several times. I tried to get him to think about Helen Lemmy. Helen Lemmy uh, is important, I think anyway, in Iowa City, and if I were writing an article about this book and what it means to Iowa City, I'd talk about Helen Lemmy. I couldn't convince him to pay any attention to this, but 
Uh, Helen uh, is the oldest of the Renfro children, and as you know, she married uh, Alan. They, they lived here for uh, quite a number of years. She took her bachelor's degree here. She'd begun at Fisk and had left Fisk. Her, her sister told me, Edith told me, that uh, Helen had left Fisk because she was too dark. She felt that she was discriminated against because of her skin color at Fisk, which of course was, was uh, largely, anyway, uh, African American. Um, Helen came back here. She took a job for a number of years. She worked in, uh, I'm not sure what you'd call that uh, lab, a man by the name of DeGowan, who developed uh, the ability to uh, preserve and transfer blood. The first transfusion center, I think, west of the Mississippi, I believe, was here. And she worked in that lab. So, I mean, it's not as though she was, you know, uh, washing the floors or something. She was already in something pretty important. But she and her husband, uh, as you probably know, opened her, their home to African Americans who could not live in the dormitories in those years. And they had a, a evidently, one, there are a whole lot of stories. I can't tell you all the, the stories. Uh, one of the favorites that I have, uh, I read this in the, the Daily Iowan, I think it was, Duke Ellington and his orchestra came to the university 43, I think it was, I can't remember what year it was, but anyway, he came and gave it. And after the concert, Duke and the orchestra all trooped down to the Lemmy House on Capitol uh, Street, and uh, all night they played down in the basement. <clears throat> it was a great occasion, this was written up later, they said there'd never been any better jazz in, in Iowa City than there was that night. But quite apart from having Duke Ellington there, the basement was a place where people always socialized. The walls had names written on it, Years later, after Helen died, they, when they dedicated the school out here, some of you will know there's a, a school named after her on Washington Street, I think it is, uh, there were tons of students who came back and talked about Ma Lemmy and all the fun they used to have in the basement. So, I mean, she was uh, voted the Citizen of the Year and so on. There were all kinds of things that came her way. A remarkable woman. She came from Grinnell. Her sister, I already mentioned something about, Alice was the second oldest. Alice. Um, had to defer going to college for a number of years because it's complicated. They sent their son off to the Hampton Institute for a while, so it was, I think, financial and some other things. But Alice finally did. Uh, she uh, went to Hampton as well, and after Hampton, she took a job at the Library of Congress, and as I said, did very well there, uh, for, served for about 40 years at the Library of Congress, and again, this was uh, uh, un unmentioned. The third oldest was Rudy, or Rudolph, uh, Renfro, you see him here in military uniform. He, he was in the army for several years during uh, World War II. But um, he was more important, I think, in lots of other ways. I, I was astounded to discover in uh, W.B. E. Du Bois's magazine, Crisis, that here was Rudy Renfro. There was a big uh, to-do, not only at Hampton, it happened at other schools too in the 20s, when the largely white leadership of the historically black uh, colleges and universities proved to be rather insensitive to the students and their concerns about race. And something like this happened at uh, Hampton, and Rudy was part of the organizing committee. It was a big to do. Remember, I remember Greg was in charge of all this and he tried to send all the students home, and, and uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, Rudy ended up on the pages of W.B. Du Bois's uh, journal for this, uh, for this purpose. And uh, again, I, nobody seems to have said anything about it. After he left Hampton, he settled in D.C., where he became associated with something called the New Negro Alliance, which was another activist group. I don't know a great deal about this. They produced their own uh, newspaper, which, so far as I know, exists only in one copy now, the Smithsonian uh, uh, African American Community Museum uh, is the only one that holds a copy of it. But among other things, they were instrumental in organizing boycotts of white businesses that refused to hire black employees. Um, Safeway uh, grocery store was behind much of this, but it wasn't the only one that they uh, worked against. And so some of these photographs, are, this is a, a uh, Addison Skurlock photograph. Skurlock, one of the most accomplished, I think, African-American photographers, has this photograph. And there's uh, Rudy right in the middle, in the back. This is Rudy in the heart of that. Uh, of that too. So, I mean, long before we heard of Martin Luther King and other people, Rudy Renfro was out there doing stuff for his community, and I think this is a shame that we didn't know more, uh, more about it. Evan L. Uh, was the fourth of the children. She began, uh, she left uh, the high school and started at Iowa State University. She was always interested in uh, nutrition and dietetics. Her mother had a big garden, 
Uh, Edith was very funny. We had a sort of question and answer uh, publicly one time, and uh, her dad uh, worked for many years as a cook in a hotel in, uh, in Grinnell. And she said her dad loved to plant all these different things. He was always looking through the, the magazines, you know, what seeds you could order and so on. And she said, and whatever my dad planted, my mother uh, put up, right, and, and canning and so on. So they had all this stuff in the basement that came out. And, and Evan L. was a, a rather prominent uh, nutrition. Uh, she finished, actually, at the University of Iowa, took her bachelor's degree here, and then, as I mentioned a moment ago, stayed on to to get a master's. She taught at several other historically black uh, institutions, Lincoln, Tuskegee, and so on. She ended up at Savannah State College, where she taught for about 25 years and was the chair of, of the department for all that time. So a very accomplished uh, person uh, of, her own, of her own right. <clears throat> now, another section of the book deals with a family much less accomplished, I guess, in most, uh, most respects, the Tibbs family. And what we know about the Tibbs comes in part from this artifact that uh, survived. It's a shoeshine chair that stood for many years in a uh, barber shop on 4th Avenue and was then consigned to the basement. It was discovered kind of by accident in the 1990s. Nobody knew whose it was and so on. And it came out sooner or later that this was the chair that Jim Tibbs, who was the father of the family, that Jim Tibbs uh, used. <clears throat> I love that it has a heart in the back of it. I like to think about Jim Tibbs sitting down in front. There was like a little stool. You know, you, you stepped up into it. This is a kind of rickety-looking chair to me, but anyway. Uh, you stepped up into it and put your feet up high, and then the guy was down below you, right? So the guy down below shining your shoes and so on, when you get up, he looks up, and there's a heart behind that, uh, behind that body. Uh, probably an accident, but I like to think about it anyway. So uh, Jim Tibbs was born in Missouri. He made his way to Iowa and... and uh, uh, he served in World War I for a while, and shortly after he returned from the war, he married another Grinnell woman, uh, Mamie or, or Mary Redrick, and they had six, uh, six children. Um, I have not succeeded in finding as much about most of those children. I know almost nothing about Shirley, but some of the others we do know, uh, do know something about. <clears throat> Jim Tibbs was remembered, but again, it's a kind of... Uh, there, there's no photograph that I can find of Jim Tibbs. Um, there was no obituary of him published in the newspaper. There was, however, a kind of editorial. It was a curious sort of thing. The, the, the uh, editor knew of Tibbs and wanted to say something about him, but it's not exactly a, 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 an obituary. But one of the things that uh, is included in this remarkable document is this reference to how people used to joke and make fun of Tibbs. And again, I thought about that heart behind the uh, chair and why these people were doing that. Now, according to the newspaper, the next line or two after this says, well, Jim probably really liked it, you know, and he really would have felt bad if it had stopped and so on. I don't think so, but, you know, that's at least what was, what was written down. But it, it to me, uh, illustrated how being black in Grinnell was almost the same thing as not being there. <clears throat> Now, <clears throat> what I know about the Tibbs comes in part through a rather remarkable thing, and I'm going to try to finish with this here, I think. <clears throat> in the 1970s, it turns out, a group of Grinnell College students, now, okay, it's the 70s, right? <laughs> Grinnell College students, okay. What, what they said was that they were just walking down the street. This is about a mile from campus, uh, South Elm Street, they're walking down the street and they saw pieces of paper blowing in the wind. And they felt instantly a kind of uh, scholars, archivist compassion <laughs> and started collecting all these papers. So uh, then they dragged them all back up to the college. Well, the house in question, in fact, had been vacant. Uh, Mamie Tibbs, the, the mother, Mamie Tibbs, uh, had left to move to Omaha where several of her children were living in the house. It was a wreck. We know something about it. It was kind of a bad... I don't know what the students were there, but I'm sure they weren't there in order to serve as archivists. But they, <laughs> they did nevertheless manage to collect more than 100 letters that were sent to various members of the Tibbs family. A collection of photographs, uh, not a lot, but there are some, including a color photograph of one of the, the young, uh, young women. Uh, some personal papers, it was a banking document and some things like that. All of this ended up in the archive. And in uh, 1974, one of the college professors wrote to one of the surviving sons, Albert uh, Tibbs, who 
ran a rather successful uh, construction enterprise in Omaha, wrote to Albert Tibbs and said, look, we have these papers and so on, can we put them in the college archives? And Albert wrote back, sure, you know, so the papers survived. I have tried very hard to find out who these students were. Uh, I went through the alumni database and I, I looked at African Americans in the early 70s, I looked at uh, history majors in the early 70s, American studies majors in the early 70s. This was a time when uh, race on campus was a very heated subject. There was at, the, at almost exactly this time, there was a student committee on the college campus that had petitioned for two sociology professors to be fired for what they called blatant racism. And they complained that the college also had been uh, neglectful in appointing African Americans to the faculty. So, I mean, the student paper, the college student paper was full of these things and letters were being written, you know, come on, let's, let's do better about all this and so on. Not a word about the discovery of these papers. The town newspaper, not a word about the discovery of these papers. So it's a, it, and I've, you know, I wrote to more than 60 uh, Grinnell alums from around that time. Uh, only about 30 of them wrote back. Almost always they say, what a great story. <laughs> we never heard of it. So I still don't know, I'm dying to know why they were doing this and who did it and so on. Maybe someday we'll find out about it. But the thing that, that makes it relevant here, I think, is that it's, an, an, to my way of thinking, a way, an unusually rich collection of material about the internal life of an African-American family. Most of these letters are letters that were written to the children. Harold, the oldest one in particular, are several women who tried to win his affection, and then two of the younger daughters got a lot of attention from letter writers. But there's also a large selection of letters from Mamie, the mother, who was writing to her youngest son, Ed, who had some sort of mental issues. I don't know what they are, but he was in Mount Pleasant for a number of years, and so she wrote letters back and forth, and they're very informative materials. It's an extremely rich collection, in my opinion, and I don't know exactly what the parallels might be somewhere else, but it's allowed us to see some into the lives of these people that I think otherwise we couldn't see. You've been very kind. I know you have places to go and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you.